God, as we uh, open up your word, here in this month of May, we've been wanting to learn about you, the God of the Bible. Not our concept, not what people say, not even what pastors say, but what does your word say about you? Help us. Give us the ability to have ears to hear and a heart to receive today. Amen. So when you wake up in the morning and you go to the mirror and you stare at the mirror, you're seeing an image in that mirror. What do you like about what you see? What do you like about when you're looking at that mirror and you're seeing an image of the person standing on this side, what do you like? Or do you pick out the things you don't like? Especially when you put on your glasses, you go, oh, tough night. We're created in God's image. It's a mirror reflection. That's where we're going to go this morning. But in that process, we're going to talk about God's heart. And since it's Mother's Day, a woman's heart. Because there's a mirror reflection that's supposed to go on. And I think it happens easier with women than it does with men. At least we'll see what the Bible has to say about that. All right. Yep. We're going to Genesis chapter 1. This is where it all started as God was creating the whole universe and everything. This is what verse 27 says. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Now, People have gotten this wrong in a long time when it says he created a male and female and in his image. Some go, so God is half man, half woman? Not really. Well, then how did he create woman and how is he man and how does all that fit together? That's what we learn in the God of the Bible today a little bit. Here's my story as you read the rest of what t- takes place in chapter 1. What's actually happening is... God created Adam, and he gives Adam the job of naming the animals, and they're coming by, and as he's naming them, he notices for every male animal, there is this female animal, and they, they are partners in life, and yes, they even have babies and everything, and so God would come and talk with Adam in the cool of the days, what the Bible says. And I imagine he said, hey, I notice as I'm naming these animals, for every male, there's this partner, and they're different. And God said, that's the female of the species. Oh. And God looked at man, and he says, it's not good for man to be alone. And he says, so I'm going to make a partner for you, but it's going to cost you. Adam said, okay, what's it going to cost me? He goes, it's going to cost you an arm and a leg. Adam said, so what can I get for a rib? (laughs) All right, so that portion might not be there in the Bible. But we learn something in verse 27. You're made in God's image. So we're going to ask some questions. We asked it last week as we started this, the God of the Bible. And the questions are the where, what, and how. Here's the first one. Where do you get your information about God? Where do you personally get it? Do you get it by what you hear on the news, by what you thought about when you grew up, what other people said, your life experiences? Where do you get your information about God? Secondly, what do you think about Him? What's your image of God? What do you think about him? What are your thoughts when you think about God? Is he some guy with really white hair and a long beard standing up there with a club ready to to hit people over the head? What do you think about God? And thirdly, how do you know if your thoughts about God are accurate? How do you know if, if what you're thinking about God is an accurate thought at all? That's why we're studying the God of the Bible. Since he wrote this book, I figure he put a lot about himself in here, don't you? And so in this whole month of May, we're going to look about what God says about himself. And he said he created us in his image, so he's given us an idea. And so fourthly here, this is an important one, what if what you believe is false? And this could be killing you. You could be missing out on a lot of potential 
that the creator of the universe planned for you because you had a belief about where you got your information from, what you thought about him, and how you thought about him, and it was all false belief that you didn't go to this source, his book. The only book that says holy on it. So this morning we're going to start as we're, we're going to work our way to the image of God and a reflection, the mirror reflection of God's heart and especially a woman's heart. But let's talk just for a moment more the difference between a concept and an image. Okay, So you can have a concept, but it may not mean you have a proper image. Each person has a concept about God. It doesn't mean it's correct, does it? Just because you have a concept about God. See, the second point on this is the image of God is what separates you and I from the animals. He created us in His image. He created us male and female. Now, the Bible is very clear. It's His book that He gives, Jesus gives His Father a male name. When they said, pray, who do we pray to? He said, pray our Father. So, now we know God is spirit. Jesus is the one that took on the flesh, but yet he took on the flesh and was a man. So is God all man? The likelihood is probably yes. Now, some really, really far out thinking theologians said, well, what about the Holy Spirit? A lot of times when he talks about the Holy Spirit, it says, and she gives you wisdom. So maybe there's some attributes inside of God, like his heart and parts of him that has this makeup that is male and female on the inside. But on the outside, if you could create what God is on the outside, because he's not a person until Jesus took on personhood, he identified as a male. But he said he created all of us in his image, male and female. Are you following so far? Woo! I feel like I'm in biology class here right now. And what a day to do this in a world that really is so mixed up about gender. Wow. They really need to get in the Bible, don't they? Here's a statement that I want you to think about. And we've been looking at this and we're going to look at it all month. I changed it a little different here today than last week. What you think about God determines how you process all aspects of life. And then I put in parentheses, think in increments. Your concept of God and your ability to see His image in other Christians or in the world is sometimes very blurry, all based on how you've been taught to think about Him. That's why it's so important that you learn who He is through His Word. We're going to go and think increments and look at his image, and look at how it's developed, how God intended you and I to develop, seeing the mirror reflection, that when you look in the mirror, you see something of God in that mirror. Whoa. Maybe not physically, but you sense. It's more than feelings. You know, sometimes we go, I just feel like I've been a good person. Well, what do you do when you feel like you've really been a bad person? If you're creating his image, What is it that's the reflection, the mirror image of Him? Let's pause and pray. This is an important part from here on that you put the pieces of the puzzle together. God, I kind of laid down the foundation here. Would you help people connect these pieces? You gave them in Your Word. Help us to connect them with our life. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, it goes all the way back to Deuteronomy chapter 6. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, God is giving humanity what they must do to be in a relationship with Him. So Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, you see it up there. You're going to see the increments of how He wants you to grow in your thinking and your process about Him. Look at the Scripture. It says, love the Lord your God with all your first increment, your heart. And then with your soul, what is that? And with all your strength or might. So these are the steps of starting to develop a ability to see the image of God, even within your own life, and how you can see it reflected in other people's lives. How they what? Love God with all their heart, 
with all their soul and with all their strength. All right, here's a tough question. Is this commandment possible? Could we do those things? Well, let's look at the first one. In an increment, he's saying love God with all your heart. With all your heart is a scripture there is Psalms 8611. Psalms 8611 is a powerful scripture that gives you an insight. How do you how do you love a being that you don't see, but you hear that he created you? How do you love him with all your heart? Psalm 8611. Go to the book, the God of the Bible. He gives the answers. This is the only book that I know of that is giving you the, the front part of the puzzle, but then he connects the pieces of it so that you can go, I see the picture. All right? And in Psalms 86, 11, here's what it says. Teach me. Who's supposed to teach us? Teach me your way, Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. Okay. So how do we love God with all our heart? Our heart has to be taught from Him. So we ask Him, could you work with this thing called our heart? And could you teach it not to be divided? Now, if you're in a relationship, and by the way, congratulations to the newlywed couples here. They're going to be going on a cruise here this afternoon. Hannah and Tyler uh, shared their... Yeah, there were wedding vows and everything and had a great time this weekend. And so uh, they're, they're leaving grandbaby with us and they're going their way. So here's, here's something. Now, what if when you said the vows, you said, I will give all my heart to you. You'll be the only one. This ring will symbolize I don't belong to anybody else except on weekends. That probably wouldn't fly too good. You would say, well, 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 wait a minute. There's a dividing line there. You're what? I, well, you have me five days a week. Why can't I have me and whoever else just two days a week? I mean, come on. That's more than 50% of the time. You're getting five days. I don't get five days for me. I'm giving five days to you. Do you, do you ever feel like that sometimes you have that conversation with God? Hey, I gave you Sunday. Come on, man. I, I came to church and I sat there and I listened. I did all the stuff. Hey, you got your hour, hour and a half. And he's saying, no, no. If you're going to have a mirror reflection of who I am, you've got to love me with all your heart. It has to be undivided. So that means it's 24-7 where there is someone inside your heart that is directing you in all aspects of life. That's why that statement, what you think about him, is so important. He won't direct your life. He won't overrun your life. You have to invite him to guide your life. You have to actually invite him inside your heart so that your heart could become undivided and that he could start teaching you. In the early part of being a Christian, I, I, I started praying this way, and I've watched that it works a lot of times, that, God, if I'm doing something that's really not really that's going to bring a lot of good press to you, a lot of good PR to who you are through my life, would you let my heart go off like an alarm clock? I started praying that way for my, my boys, and I, I remember I got a call from Sean. He was a freshman in college. He's at the emergency room. He says, Dad, my heart's been racing. I said, what you been up to? He was so worried that night that he actually slept in the parking lot. They said, you're fine and everything else. We don't know why your heart's racing, maybe overstimulated. He slept in his car out there because he said it kept on. I said, Sean, there's something that God's been wanting to get your attention because I've prayed since you were born. He never wanted to tell me. But I know this. He figured it out. He learned God could teach him how to have an undivided heart. And He's a pastor today. He's been, he was a missionary. Now he's a pastor. And, and I'm not saying if you have an undivided heart, you're all going to become pastors. If you're all pastors, who's going to be the people in the pew? All right? So that's not the purpose of it. But you can see how this is an incremental process. You start by showing your heart has a reflection, an image of God inside. And that can only happen when Christ comes in and lives inside you. Now... It goes on to say, again, is this commandment possible? Love them with all your heart. 
or with all your soul. Now, in Luke 10, 27, Jesus actually separates the soul and gives a fourth category, the mind. So some people go, the soul is how you think and you reason and your will. I think it's different than that because Jesus separated it. As a matter of fact, let me give you a little thing that, that most of you haven't learned yet, but today you've got it. You don't have a soul. You are a soul. You have a body. You're not your body. Aren't you glad? Because what that body was when you were in your 20s, it's not what you are in your 50s or 60s. So you're not your body. And if you're born with a deformed body, like Nick Vudicek with no arms and no legs except for a little flipper in that, if he was his body, he would have a bad body image. But he is truly a human being. Here's the, here's the statement here. Being human is a person is based on your soul, not your body. Do you remember when they, in the old days, they used to say, oh, they got an old soul. It means they were mature in something on the inside. Your soul is the part of you that has eternity attached to it. That's where the image of God was placed. Inside of you, your soul. Even Hollywood did a movie. They called it Eight Grams. And the Eight Grams was that these young guys and gals were actually putting themselves in a state of death and the other ones would stand there with the shockers and they'd see how long they could experience death and shock them back and they said they were able to measure the difference in their weight when they were dead and when they were alive by eight grams so i don't know how much eight grams is but they they were saying that that could possibly be the soul leaving the body where is the soul it's inside now, to the Jewish people, they called the, the bow center, the knowing center. I know it. See, we always go, no, I know it, and we point to our brain. They knew it in their innermost. That's the way they, they, we talk in the Bible, in the Hebrew. I know it in my innermost, your soul. And he's saying, so love me with all your soul. Love me with the ability to reflect that you were created with eternity in mind, not 70, 80, 90 years. That body is going to die, but the soul will not. Very interesting. All right, so you, we're in the second increment. Let's go to the third one. Is this even possible, this commandment? Love them with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Isaiah the prophet put this in here, and it de deals with strength. In Isaiah 40, 29, he says, he gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. So when he's asking us to love us with all our strength, he knows most of us don't have much strength to do that. But if we have a relationship with him and we start seeing the mirror reflection, the image of God in our life, when we're weak, the New Testament says, when I feel weak, ask him and speak to him, he will be strong. Whoa, Christ in me will be strong when I feel weak emotionally, mentally, and yes, I believe even physically. All right, so there's the three that Deuteronomy gave. Love them with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Now, is this commandment possible? Jesus put a fourth category. It's the New Testament. He's God. He can add to it. He actually separated what so, for so many thousands of years, people said the soul is the mind and the will. And he said, no, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And he put the mind in there. But if you notice, in Luke chapter 10, verse 27, it's the last step. It's not the first. It's the last step that your mind can start grasping things that are beyond this world, that are beyond what you can just see in three dimensions. If you think there's only three dimensions to all of life, you've been living in a box. And he said, as the last step, love me with all your mind. 
that's a person that's learned to see the image of God in their life first in their heart, that they realize their soul, that, that they start making decisions based on eternity, not just the here and now. Whoa. I wonder if we took a survey. How many people in the last month made a decision based on eternity instead of just the here and now? And if you haven't, possibly you haven't moved to soul decisions. To, is this better for me or will it show someone else a mirror image of God in my life? That's a soul decision right there. All right, so we're, we're on the home stretch. Here's where I'm connecting God's heart with a woman's heart. When he said he would make them both male and female, I, I truly believe that he knew that there would be something different in a woman's heart than within a man's heart. As a matter of fact, in 35 years of being a pastor, I've watched this problem so much. Men want to understand God, this him being your savior. They want to understand it here on the last category, the mind first. Give me the ability to reason that. And I go, well, wait a minute. This is still thinking in this three-dimensional world. You've got to allow him to start here in the heart, work deeper into your soul, and that with all your strength, you want what he has told you, and he'll start transforming your thinking. But I've seen, for the most part, in 35 years, most women accept the relationship with Jesus Christ right here in their heart first. How's that so? Well, let me show you some of the scriptures, ladies. These are for you to read this week. We're not going to study all these. Don't get freaked out. But here's number one. Reflecting God's heart or image. I think women do this easier. Proverbs 13.1 is a keeper of the home. She builds her house, is what Proverbs 13.1 says. A keeper of the home. <laughs> God's home is the whole universe, and he cares what happens to it. But something about most men, you just tell them where they're supposed to sleep. Like, okay, we're good. Tell them where you can sit down to eat. Okay, we're great. But the woman is a keeper of the home. She knows that it's a place, a refuge that you get out of all that and get to come here. Is it possible? That's why when Jesus came he said, I will build a church, a place of refuge where a community that understand that I live in your heart and I'm going to develop this intimate relationship with your soul and with your mind and with your strength, all this, and you'll come together in that place of refuge here. That's what Jesus came to do. And women do that pretty much naturally. The second one is, in 1 Timothy 5.10, it says that women are kind in servanthood. Now, these are generalities. I know you could tell me there's some women, oh man, I've had some really bad women servers in life, you know. But what it's saying is, at nature, at their DNA of being created in God's image, I believe these five things are things that are placed within a woman's heart that can come more naturally. Servanthood. When does that start for a woman? Usually when they become a mom. Because they became a co-creator. Yes, men help in the conception part of it, but a woman's body creates and grows and nurtures. And then somewhere on the line, that woman's got to get that baby out of that body. Men have no idea. And we don't want to. Okay? But through that, it's amazing. This bond with a creation that's part of you. That yes, they're an image of you. They look like mom. They look like dad. And it was nurtured and baked in an oven for nine months. Men don't get to experience that. Women do, and I believe that puts in this kind of servanthood and number three proverbs 31 30 that they speak wisdom they realized i'm responsible that baby's going to actually feed off my body that's the way god created women and could live that way for a year or more some in the old testament for three years before they started weaning the children oh my i have to speak wisdom 
Where's the wisdom come from? Proverbs 31 says that she gets it from God, not from her husband. But her family and her husband both says she's wise. She knows all this. Why? She's had to raise them 24-7. She's the one that knows that difference between the cry that's an angry cry and a hungry cry and a mad cry and all those other cries. I just go there crying. Right? There's something in the woman's heart that's created in God's image that has these things. And Titus 2, 3 and 5 says, she teaches what is good. Who does? She does. She wants what is good for her family, for her children, for her life. She doesn't want anything that's bad. Now, in the 20th and 21st century, we started talking about the bad girls. That's a phenomenon because we've gotten so far away from God. The reality was, all through history, it's been the bad boys. Because our hearts are harder. But women have always been drawn to good easier. I'm telling you what theologians have found through the centuries. Now, we live in a different age today than humanity has ever seen. And it was foretold that it would come to pass this way in the God that wrote this book, the God that we're studying about. The fifth part here, the reflecting of God's heart or image, is in 1 Peter 3, 4, knows the power of a gentle and quiet spirit. A gentle and quiet spirit. Now, again, generality. Can women be loud and boisterous and all the rest? Yes, but that's not really true nature. Most women, they'll get quiet when everybody else is getting loud. They step back. And you know what's really something? When you learn to submit that to God, it's a powerful... I've seen this woman use that gentle, quiet spirit, and I'm like, oh, I'm in trouble. She's moving in the realm of her image of God's heart, that it's a gentle and quiet spirit. The gentle answer turns away wrath. The quiet spirit that she's, I, I need to hear from God, not just from you right now. Oh my, that moves me tremendously. Now, can a man develop this kind of heart? Yes. And the best way they develop it is having Jesus Christ come in. And when a woman has Jesus Christ come in their heart, it's like this is put in that heart that they've already been made in this image of God on steroids, like they really start getting in tune. When guys ask Jesus in, all of a sudden we start getting a tender heart. I remember growing up and I'd see some of these guys that I know they were rough men. And all of a sudden when Jesus came in, all of a sudden I could see the tears and the tenderness and I'm going... What stinking happened to these guys? They got what the Bible calls a new heart. That's what he says when he comes in. I will give you a new heart. Because especially for the men, the old heart's not that good. I believe the DNA of a woman's heart is so much more the image reflection of God. And when she asks Jesus in, she comes to life. Now, these are all attributes that today... Our world attacks this. They would say he's trying to make the woman barefoot and pregnant in the home. The reality is our world is in trouble because there isn't anybody that wants to rock the cradle anymore. There's anybody that wants to set society right by starting with them when they're their babies. This is how God intended the world to become better, is through this part. In closing, let me give you this scripture. Mark 12, verse 16. Everybody wanted to know what belongs to the government, what belongs to this person, what belongs to that, and what belongs to God. And Jesus said this. He said, bring me a coin. And he says, whose image is on this coin? They go, Caesar. And he gives this powerful reply. He says then, Give back to Caesar what is Caesar, and to God's what is God. What was on the coin? An image. A reflection of who was in control of their government. He said, what's the government's? Give to the government. But when he makes the statement, what's God? You and I are what's God. 
that soul placed inside of you, that, that DNA of the eternal that's there, we're creating his image. And he's saying, what belongs to God, give it back to God. He wants to claim every man and woman and child as his creation. What is God's? Give back to God. So here's our challenge in the second week of the God of the Bible. Where will you get your information about God? What will you start thinking about God? Do you know He's promised you a new heart? And He's promised that He would come and live in it. Now that boggles the mind. How can a God live in 7 billion plus people's lives? It's because He's God. Amen? Something to think on when we get to part three next week.